Hey everyone, welcome back to the Our Society Experiment and today's Making Movement episode, which is an introduction to the knowledge economy. Part of the Our Society Experiment is using our platform to encourage experimentation and innovation within our social technologies, our system of being. So we talk a lot about the social technology of democracy, but there are other social technologies out there, which one being the market economy, for example. The market economy seems just as naturalized to us as democracy, it's just how it is, um, but there are, you know, because of the technological transitions we're making as a collective whole, they, there are a number of options we could consider for kind of reshaping and reimagining how we view production, how we view work, how we view life and purpose. Um, and that kind of brings into play the concept of the knowledge economy. So to begin, we have to understand that in all history, there's always been a most advanced form of production. Right? That's what drives nation states, that's what drives economies, is the best way of producing. So historically in the U.S., we had an industrial revolution and then you know, manufacturing and assembly lines and mass production entered the U.S. And that, for a very long time in our history, was the most advanced form of production. Unfortunately, that's no longer the case. Um, the, you know, now, the most advanced form of production would be the knowledge economy, would be development, it would be software and technology. Uh, these, we call them the most advanced forms of production because uh, A, their, speed, their rapid speed of growth um, and their innovation and imagination are significantly higher than anything else we've ever witnessed in the past. Um, B, they supersede a law that has essentially for a very long time kind of helped define economics. And that law is a law of diminishing returns. So what that means, it, kind of shorthand, is essentially um, if I sell widgets, if I buy widgets from place A, bring them to myself and, and sell them to the consumer, there is essentially a, a point of diminishing returns on my investments. So uh, if I, you know, when I start out, every, let's say every dollar I invest, I return another dollar. Well, after my sixth, seventh year in business, now every dollar I invest, I'm really only able to recoup maybe 50 cents on that dollar. Why? Well, because produ uh, competition has increased, right? The cost of materials has increased as the market has grown, so has demand. Um, supply may or may not have, depending on that. So this is a pretty stable law that kind of follows many industries. Eventually you get to a point on your, your curve where the same dollar you invested that you know, doubled itself is now halving itself, and then it may even go lower than that. So that is the, you know, the law of diminishing returns. The knowledge economy, technology, programming, and development is not, is not constrained by the law of diminishing returns. And I think that's a really important concept to kind of lay the foundation for our intro to the knowledge economy. Why, and why is programming not subject to diminishing returns? Well, it's because it's, it's about imagination, right? It's about creativity. And more importantly, every new revolution in programming, every new language that's developed, every new software that's developed, opens the eyes, minds, and possibilities that exist for future programs to build upon. So this foundation builds itself much more rapidly than, for example, something in the you know, mass manufacturing, mass production. Now, the, so the knowledge economy of today is, is really located in, for example, we would consider Silicon Valley, but there's a number of other tech hubs. But the challenge that we face with the knowledge economy compared to the traditional manufacturing economy um, is that it's insular. Okay, or that it's exclusive to some extent, which means that workers within the knowledge economy, so workers within you know, Silicon Valley or San Francisco, for example, can move to one company from another. If you're a developer and you're a skilled developer, uh, you have the ability to kind of move from company to company. And, and although your projects will be different, if you've kept up with the constant pace of innovation and learning that's required to be a part of the knowledge economy, your skills are very transferable uh, within those high, you know, those high intensity, high knowledge, high innovation, um, those high innovation areas. But if you compare that to traditional manufacturing and the old style of mass production, in, and that being the, you know, for example, when that was the most advanced form of productions, the, the worker and the labor was much less skilled. I mean, it really required a sense of rudimentary reading, right? Like, a, you know, a sign with an electric bolt that said, don't touch. Um, it required you to be able to pull the lever and, and judge. And of course, there was more advanced forms. Um, but for the most part, the lowest entry level workers could transfer from factory to factory. Um, that would be an exclusive 
you know, exclusive uh, economy in that if you were trained, you could go to any firm and do the same manufacturing job, pretty much. I mean, it's the same skill set. The challenge with the current knowledge economy is to some extent it's, it's exclusive, and that's not a fault of anyone. It is just a highly technical field. However, more and more we see trends uh, in every industry where industries that were traditionally considered separate from technology have now completely merged with technology. So I can give um, two examples. Uh, one would be medical advances. Medicine and healthcare has to some extent become an information technology and we need to look no further than the advances, uh, for example, with the CRISPR gene editing technology. I mean, this just, that technology would just not be available without the massive achievements we've made in processing power uh, as well as development of software and other aspects of the technical revolution. So this ascendancy has allowed us to now ascend what traditional medicine would have ever been able to do. Now we can edit genes, um, which is a pretty tremendous accomplishment in the, in the human paradigm. Um, now, another example would be uh, precision agriculture. You know, agriculture has become a, a massive industry controlled by a very select few. Um, and that's allowed it to be much more efficient, drive costs down, uh, and that's because, and really eliminate a lot of the workforce to some extent because of the machines uh, that can be incredibly precise with their planting and their harvesting of the crops. So these are just two industries, um, but the list goes on. I mean, as we continue our technological ascendancy, every industry will some, to some extent become an information industry where the most advanced forms of production, the most advanced forms of uh, generating you know, products or, and wealth will be controlled and dictated by you know, advances in information technology. Um, oh, you know, another example is, for example, high finance. High finance now is all but, you know, the majority of high finance trading is done by algorithms. Um, it's, it's very little human interaction anymore, um, which is why it's so challenging for now retail investors because you're, you're competing against computers, essentially. So again, um, these, this is you know, kind of laying the foundation between the two economies. We have the mass production economy, which had, was you know, inclusive in that the skill level was low and work was easily transferable between firms. And we have the knowledge economy, which is skill intensive. Uh, right? It's, and the knowledge is also you know, exchangeable between firms. However, the barrier to entry is high in that there's a high level of skill needed to enter the knowledge economy. Uh, again, the benefits of the knowledge economy, not subject to diminishing returns, traditional manufacturing, su subject to diminishing returns. So in imagining an alternative to, you know, to our current economy, again, our society is about creating alternatives where, you know, in a system of no alternatives, we as a collective would benefit from disseminating and, and finding ways to disseminate the knowledge economy model into every industry. And that kind of harkens back to a, a real fundamental concept that I think helps define what it means to be human. Advances in technology have always increased the human experience, uh, whether it be fire, to the bow and arrow, to a, you know, to a, a lathe, um, to a printing press, to the computer, so forth and so on. They've always increased our ability to, to define what it means to be human, um, right? Mass communication, all of these technologies have helped us redefine the world we live in. And as Professor Roberto Unger often talks about, um, which I think is a, a brilliant concept, is that no human should have to do this job that a machine can do. And the basic concept is that anything that we can repeat, we can you know, write into a formula. And anything we can write into a formula, a, a machine can do, right? Through programming, whether it be software or hardware. But the idea is we can program a machine to do anything that can be repeated. And the human experience, what it means to be human in the new knowledge economy, should be designated to doing things that machine cannot do. So, uh, for example, like being creative, innovating new things, experimenting with new ideas. Um, and really, if we were to infuse the knowledge economy model of experimentation and innovation and merging all of our manufacturing and other industries with technology, then this would allow us to experience levels of innovation and experimentation that would be, you know, at the current state, uh, really unfathomable. Uh, and that would do incredible things for our economy, for our quality of life, and really, most importantly, help to redefine what it means to be a, a human being in, in 2018 and beyond. So what would it take to kind of disseminate the practices of the knowledge economy? Well, that would take probably a decentralized effort within the U.S. and, and coordinated nationally 
to kind of open up these industries uh, as much as possible, disseminating the most advanced forms of productions across industries. Um, it would take you a political and collective willpower of the people, uh, as well as the government kind of you know, working along with these companies to kind of open them up. But the future economy will most likely be that the best companies are also the best schools. Our world is constantly changing, and the reality of, of our you know, future is that while specialization is important and, and detailed specialization is going to be critical, especially for advancing, uh, we're going to have to constantly be learning. I mean, that is just the future. Uh, and I think that's one of the big challenges we have right now in the U.S. is that, unfortunately, our technological revolution has left a certain you know, amount of our population behind. Um, and you know, through the loss of their job and their ability to produce, um, which I believe, you know, to be candid, is, is much deeper than just a job and money. It's about purpose, right? It, it's, we all want to contribute. We all want to do great things or at least contribute to some extent to help get by. We all feel good about doing positive things to help further, whether it's collective interests of a group, a family, you know, a company, whatever the case may be, there's a lot to be earned by being a contributor. And it builds a lot of self-worth and it builds a lot of value you know, in the individual. So in thinking about these introspective qualities, it's why I, I keep referring to you know, redefining what it means to be human. Uh, because should we, you, if we were able to achieve a programmatic solution to disseminating the knowledge economy into every industry, uh, making it so that um, we reduce the U.S.'s reliance on any sort of manufacturing and constantly re produce innovation um, and technology. Now, of course, you know, ma manufacturing in the U.S. is not a bad thing, but we want to make sure that our manufacturing is focused on cutting edge and innovative technologies created by the knowledge economy. Uh, and through automation, through the sharing of best practices, and, and through creating a, a, a collective industry, um, or I should say a collective theory and, and philosophy across all the industries in the U.S. of focusing just on the most advanced forms of production, not you know, struggling to kind of revive or maintain production models that are essentially you know, becoming obsolete, we can truly bring about a new era of economic prosperity for all of us. The, the challenge is how do we as a collective kind of make the policies and programs to disseminate this theory of the knowledge economy and, and how to disseminate these best practices. We hope here in our society that our social value algorithms will help kind of predict away and kind of open that idea up to more and more individuals as they choose to participate in our civic discourse and in our civic engagement and elected office through the Our Society platform. Uh, and this is just an introduction. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of go more into the knowledge economy in detail. It's something I'm, I'm really a big fan of. I'll actually post a link uh, to Professor Roberto Unger's lectures below uh, referring to the knowledge economy. So you can you know, check them out if you're interested. And he's got a fascinating perspective that I would highly recommend. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of what I do here is I take the, the perspective and try to, you know, break it down to a little simpler terms um, for people like myself to kind of you know, really grasp it. So... Again, thanks so much for tuning into today's Making the Movement episode about the introduction of the knowledge economy and the overall theory of why it's important to disseminate the best forms of production, the most advanced forms of production uh, throughout the U.S. in the future to kind of help us usher in the new era of economic prosperity in the U.S. Thanks so much. I'll see you again.